Hello everyone, it's Donovan from One Track Jazz. Welcome to an extraordinary journey through the life and legacy of an incredible individual who has left an indelible mark on history. Today, we invite you to join us as we delve deep into the captivating story of Billie Holiday, a remarkable figure whose life's journey is nothing short of inspiring. But before we embark on this incredible journey, we kindly ask for your support. If you're as excited as we are to uncover the incredible chapters of Billie Holiday's life, please take a moment to like this video, share it with your friends and family, and hit that subscribe button so you never miss an update from us. But most importantly, stay tuned until the very end of this video. Trust us, you won't want to miss a single moment of this remarkable tale. Billie Holiday's life is a testament to the strength of the human spirit, and it's a story you won't soon forget. Now, without further ado, let's dive into the life story of Billie Holiday. Born Eleonora Fagan in 1915, her journey would become one of triumphs, but also one filled with heart-wrenching struggles. Raised in poverty, she faced the harsh realities of life in Baltimore, Maryland. Her mother often took what were then known as transportation jobs, serving on passenger railroads. Billy suffered from her mother's absences and being in others' care for her first decade of life. After attending kindergarten at St. Francis Academy, she frequently skipped school and her truancy resulted in her being brought before the juvenile court when she was nine years old. Because of her truancy, she was sent to the House of the Good Shepherd, a Catholic reform school for African American girls. After nine months, she was paroled. She dropped out of school at the age of 11. When she was nearly 12, she found a job running errands in a brothel, and she scrubbed marble steps as well as kitchen and bathroom floors of neighborhood homes. Around this time, she first heard the records of Louis Armstrong and Bessie Smith. By early 1929, Holiday had joined her mother in Harlem, New York. As a young teenager, Holiday started singing in nightclubs in Harlem. She took her professional name from Billy Dove, an actress she admired, and Clarence Halliday, her probable father. Producer John Hammond arranged for Holiday to make her recording debut at age 18 in November 1933 with Benny Goodman. She recorded two songs, Your Mother's Son-in-Law and Riff in the Scotch, the latter being her first hit. In late 1937, Holiday had a brief stint as a big band vocalist with Count Basie. The traveling conditions of the band were often poor. They performed many one-nighters in clubs, moving from city to city with little stability. Holiday chose the songs. She sang and had a hand in the arrangements, choosing to portray her developing persona of a woman unlucky in love. By February 1938, Holiday was no longer singing for Basie. Various reasons have been given for why she was fired. Holiday was hired by Artie Shaw a month after being fired. This was the first time a black female singer employed full-time toured the segregated South with a white band leader in situations where there was a lot of racial tension. In her autobiography, Holiday describes an incident in which she was not permitted to sit on the bandstand with other vocalists because she was black. In Louisville, Kentucky, a man called her the N-word and requested she sing another song. Holiday angered left the stage. In November 1938, Holiday was asked to use the service elevator at the Lincoln Hotel in New York City instead of the one used by hotel guests, because white patrons of the hotel complained. This may have been the last straw for her. She left the band shortly after. In the late 1930s, she was introduced to Strange Fruit, a song based on a poem about lynching. She performed it at a club in 1939 with some trepidation, fearing possible retaliation. Holiday said her father was denied medical treatment for a fatal lung disorder because of racial prejudice and that singing Strange Fruit reminded her of the incident. Strange Fruit remained in her repertoire for 20 years. God Bless the Child became Holiday's most popular and most covered record. It reached number 25 on the charts in 1941 and was third in Billboard Songs of the Year, selling over a million records. In 1976, the song was added to the Grammy Hall of Fame. In 1944, Holiday signed with Decca Records and recorded Loverman, one of her biggest hits. 
the success and distribution of the song made Holiday a staple in the pop community. In September 1946, Holiday began her only major film, New Orleans, in which she starred opposite Louis Armstrong. Plagued by racism, the producers were pressed to lessen Holiday's and Armstrong's roles to avoid the impression that black people created jazz. Holiday's drug addictions were a problem on the set. She earned more than $1,000 per week from club ventures, but spent most of it on heroin. Her lover, Joe Guy, traveled to Hollywood while Holiday was filming and supplied her with drugs. Guy was later banned from the set. In 1947, while at her commercial peak, Holiday was arrested for possession of narcotics. During the trial, she heard that her lawyer would not come to the trial to represent her, dehydrated and unable to hold down food. She pleaded guilty and asked to be sent to the hospital. She was sentenced to Alderson Federal Prison Camp in West Virginia. However, Holiday was released early on March 16, 1948, because of good behavior. A comeback concert at Carnegie Hall was held on March 27, 1948, to a sold-out crowd. By the 1950s, Holiday's drug use, drinking, and relationships with abusive men caused her health to deteriorate. She was diagnosed with cirrhosis of the liver, although she had initially stopped drinking on her doctor's orders. It was not long before she relapsed. By May 1959, she had lost 20 pounds. Her manager, Joe Glaser, and the singer's own friends all tried in vain to persuade her to go to a hospital. On May 31, 1959, Holiday was finally taken to Metropolitan Hospital in New York for treatment of both liver and heart disease. According to writer and journalist Johan Hari, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, under Harry J. Anslinger, had been targeting Holiday since at least 1939 when she started to perform Strange Fruit. Narcotics police went to her hospital room, claiming they had found heroin in her bedroom. A grand jury was summoned to indict her, and she was arrested, handcuffed to her bed, and placed under police guard. According to Hari, after 10 days, methadone was discontinued as part of Anslinger's policy. On July 15th, she received last rites and died on July 17th, 1959, at the age of 44. She was to be arraigned the following morning. Hari accused Anslinger of being responsible for her death. In her final years, Holiday had been progressively swindled out of her earnings, and she died with 70 cents in the bank. Holiday's public stature grew in the following years after her death. Diana Ross's portrayal of Holiday in Lady Sings the Blues was nominated for an Oscar and won a Golden Globe. Holiday was posthumously nominated for 23 Grammy Awards. Her posthumous awards also include being inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame, Jazz Hall of Fame, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and the ASCAP Jazz Wall of Fame. Frank Sinatra told Ebony Magazine in 1958 about her impact on him. With few exceptions, every major pop singer in the U.S. during her generation has been touched in some way by her genius. It is Billie Holiday who was, and still remains, the greatest single musical influence on me. Lady Day is, unquestionably, the most important influence on American popular singing in the last 20 years.